yes, that rape review was. It's the best review I've ever had for anything I've been involved in. It's in Bryn Mawr Classical Review, and it's, I keep rereading it. <laughs> so I'm sure that's mystic, I guess. My deep thanks to Mark and to Green College for inviting me to give this talk this evening, and to everybody who's assisted me with my big Virgil project, and several of you are in the room. And I'd also want to acknowledge support from Shirk, uh, from the Killam Research Fellowship I held, which gave me two clear years without teaching an admin. I could not have written my book without that. And I have also had help on the project of translation history at earlier times from Green College and from the Peter Wall Institute for Advanced Studies. Is there anybody who does not have a handout? On the handout, you will see the six divisions of my talk this evening. And on the back, there are some more here. Uh, on the back, I'm not going to talk about these translations that I put on the back, but if you get bored with what I'm actually saying, you can look at those. Uh, but the, they do just illustrate uh, why this is a, such a big topic, because the, the words I've highlighted and I had that on the back in bold, Armawirum Quecano and In Signem Pietate Wirum, I've given you there Sarah Rudin's 2008 translation. She actually, by Mark's kind invitation, gave a talk here on Augustine in 2017. So maybe some of you were at that talk. This is the best modern translation of the Aeneid, in my opinion. I'm heavily biased because uh, she and I have worked, just finished working together as of yesterday sent it to the press, the second edition of her translation, which will have an introduction by me, and she's heavily revised her translation, we've worked together <coughs> on that. But I've given you a selection of other translations in English, starting with Gavin Douglas's from 1513, not published till 1553, down to Fred Arles 2007, which show you just, if, if you're not really aware of how many permutations you could deliver in English, on those few Latin words, you've got a whole uh, gamut there. Who was Virgil and why is he important? Well, I'm going to make a very bold claim here. Virgil is why we are here. And by we, I mean anybody who's an immigrant or descended from settlers. Can you put your hand up if you're an immigrant or descended from settlers? Okay. Why do I claim this? That being on the Pacific Rim of North America is because of Virgil. It's because his poem, The Aeneid, was the central text of European literature down to the 19th century. It is what elite men read. They studied it usually in Latin. If they couldn't read it in Latin, they would read it in translation, in some of the translations I'm going to talk about today. And the message of Virgil's Aeneid is about traveling west until you find your God-given country. It's the message that the elite men reading this took from, from Virgil's Aeneid was that colonialism and imperialism are sanctified by this ancient Roman text from 2,000 years ago. If you don't know the story of the Aeneid, it's basically about the Trojans leaving the sacked city of Troy in Asia Minor and seeking their new home by travelling west. Virgil replays the Homeric poems, the Odyssey and the Iliad in sequence. The first part of the Aeneid, first half of the Aeneid is a replay of the Odyssey, of uh, the travels around the Mediterranean, which you see in this map. Uh, quite a circuitous route to get from Troy to, the, to Latium, which is where Rome would be in the future. And the second part of the Aeneid is a replay of the Iliad, the, the war in Italy in order to win the land, in order to settle it. So if you put that map together with the famous saying attributed to the publisher Horace Greeley, go west, young man, you can see how I'm making this bold claim that the reason that we immigrants are here on the Pacific Rim of North America is because of Virgil. He authorized expansion westwards, exploration westwards, colonialism and imperialism. That's how he was read. But I want to also suggest that uh, for us in the 21st century, 
there are other messages that we can get out of Virgil's poem. Because the poem is actually about refugees whose city, Troy, has been sacked, burned to the ground by the Greeks. And they are desperate to find a new home. So they travel everywhere they go. If I go back to that map, they, are, they keep settling somewhere thinking, this must be it. And they build a new Troy there. But it isn't it until they get to Italy. So you can also read Virgil's Aeneid. It hasn't often been read in this way, but you can read it against the grain, perhaps a little, as about refugees escaping hardship and loss and seeking their new home. And I would think very much in accord with Mark's opening remarks about the fact that we are on unceded indigenous land here, I think it is also possible to read Virgil's Aeneid uh, as having an awareness of indigenous priority because he brings the Trojan refugees to Italy which is not terra nullius, land belonging to nobody. There are indigenous people there, the Latins and the Rutulians, and the invading Trojans have to somehow find a way of coexisting with them. And I always think when we're talking about this in Canada we talk about the First Nations and I want to appeal to you all to say it differently and say the First Nations, and that would remind us more that we have come to the land of the First Nations. So I get to that through my study of Virgil. Virgil actually has something to say about um, unceded lands, and I think this is actually very relevant to the ongoing struggle of the Lexa Weapon to achieve at the moment. Um, the incident that provokes the war in Italy, in the Aeneid, is the careless slaughter of the Italian girl Silvia's pet stag. So I read, can read that as uh, unthinking resource extraction. So I, I think you can make that connection from Virgil's text. Now Virgil, I think, was aware, although he's always been read as, a, as validating colonialism and imperialism, he was aware of the complexity of these issues, and this is seen in his handling of the future, um, the Roman future, in Book 12, the final book of the poem, when he's very careful to balance the invaders with uh, the future of the invaders, the invading Trojans, with the indigenous peoples. And this is, I'm putting this on because I'm just teaching Book 12 of the Aeneid right now. But the material that's in bold here on the slide, uh, this is Aeneas speaking, I will not make the Trojans overlords or claim the throne. With neither race the loser will forge a lasting bond on equal terms. I'll introduce our rights and gods. Latinus, this is the native king of the Latins, my father-in-law, he's going to marry, Aeneas is going to marry his daughter, can reign and keep his army while the Trojans build my town, Lavinium. And then at the very end of the book, we have Jupiter speaking as the voice of fate to his wife Juno, who has been the obstacle to Aeneas and the Trojans settling in Italy, he, he says the same thing as Aeneas has said earlier in, in, in the book. The Alsonians, meaning the native peoples, will keep their speech and customs and name unchanged. The Trojans will fade out as they breathe in. I'll introduce their rights, but make one Latin people with one language. You'll see the new race with Italian blood surpass the world and gods in piety. So that's why I think Virgil has a lot to say to us, even though his text is 2,000 years old. I want to talk to you, and I, I never cease to enjoy talking about my project, um, about this project, this book I've just finished and sent to CUP uh, a few months ago. I'm waiting to have the reader's reports back uh, pretty soon. The title that the press have given me, it's not my chosen title, is A Cultural History of Translations of Virgil from the 11th Century to the Present. I just wanted to call it Virgil Translated, which is why we didn't call the other book Virgil, and, Virgil Translated, we called it Virgil and His Translators, so I was saving that for myself. But anyway, so you three thinks this will sell better with this longer title, so who am I to disagree with that? Um, there are thousands of translations of Virgil, and this book is a catalogue 
of editions, Latin editions of Virgil, and translations. The second half is translations. And he only goes down to 1850. I always like to do a bit of show and tell. So have a look at the second half of the book. And he's got two and a half thousand. Craig Callendor is the man's name, teaches at Texas A&M. He's been really helpful to me in this project. He catalogued the translations from the, in print from the beginning down to 1850. Since then, there have been many hundreds, if not thousands more. There are many more unpublished translations uh, in, for example, people's commonplace books. Virgil was translated for people who do read Latin and for people who do not or did not into many languages. Now, of these thousands of translations, I, in my book, have managed to mention about 350 of them and discuss about 150 of them, dating from the 11th century down to 2017. And there I've just given you my show-off list of the languages that I discuss in the book, uh, which has mainly a European focus, with also uh, the parts of um, Ameri the Americas colonized by European uh, powers. And I'm also giving you a list of languages at the bottom there that I that Virgil has been translated into that I do not discuss <coughs> in the book. And I was even adding, I even added one language two days before I sent the book off because I had a sudden pang that I hadn't discussed Bulgarian. <laughs> and I didn't want Bulgarian speakers to feel left out. And I knew it would be a very short history because in Bulgaria they were reading Virgil in Latin until the 19th century. So it wasn't very difficult to read up on that and put in uh, three or four sentences on Bulgarian just for the sake of having it. What a terrible motivation. <laughs> now, Virgil's translation history has not yet been studied holistically until I, until my doing this project on. And uh, obviously I had a challenge with all these translations about how I was going to organise my project. I could have organised it chronologically. That would have meant me zigzagging from language to language. I could have organised it by language by language, linguistically. That would have missed some important connections between languages. So as I was reading and thinking and reading and thinking and talking, including to Craig Callendorf, the wonderful author of this bibliography. He helped me a lot. The conversations with him were very important. Uh, I came up with these, I came up with 10 chapters preceded by an introduction and then the introduction got out of control. <laughs> so I decided to make the introduction chapter zero <laughs> because I've always already enumerated all the other chapters. Um, so, that just gives you a glance. I'm going to put that slide up again at the very end because I think it's a slide that could prompt discussion. So don't worry that you, you, it will disappear out of sight in just a moment. And because of the, the way we did the publicity for this talk, and I mentioned a whole bunch of the poets who've translated Virgil, I'm just going to give you a slide very quickly to list some of the famous poets who have translated Virgil. There are many others in languages that are perhaps less familiar to us. Some of these were very surprising to me as I was working. Um, I, I did know from the previous co-edited book that Mark kindly mentioned that Wordsworth had translated Virgil. This seemed to me to be very surprising because the romantic sensibility doesn't exactly embrace uh, the classicism of Virgil, but he did. He spent a long time on it and was very dissatisfied with it. Also, Byron is a bit of a surprise in that list. So I'm not going to leave that one up. I'm now on to uh, section three, which is, uh, this is what I actually do in chapter one of my book. I talk about the translation of Virgil as cultural capital and as foundational to national literatures of Europe and beyond. So in my first chapter, what I do is I substantiate the suggestion of translation studies expert Susan Bassnett that the fastest and most efficacious way of establishing a natural li national literature was through the translation of high prestige foreign texts, such as Greco-Roman epic poetry. And it's quite clear to me as I started working that translation of Virgil's poems was very significant in the creation of literary language in European vernaculars often serving patriotic or even nationalistic 
agendas. And this, all of this bears out another thing that comes in at the beginning of my book, this notion of the translatio imperi et studio, et studii, the transmission of empire and learning, which is discussed in a fascinating book by Richard Boswell, The Founding Legend of Western Civilization from Virgil to Vietnam, which I think was a pretty influential book on my own thinking. So Virgil is one of the ways you can carry power and learning by translating him. Uh, translating gives you an epic vocabulary that you might not have in your native language. It gives you, you can maybe draw Latinate words from the Latin as you translate it into French or whatever language. So I found as I was working, there are quite a lot of examples of, uh, of people appropriating the cultural authority of Virgil by translating the Aeneid. And most of my remarks today are going to be about the Aeneid, though you'll get a little bit on the Georgics and the Eclipse uh, later on. So here's a list of uh, Gavin Douglas in Middle, Middle Scots, actually a Northern English dialect, um, doing something for um, Scotland, for Britain, in his translation. It's a fantastic translation of Virgil. Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, the first uh, translation into Southern English. And he is really important in the history of English literature because he pioneered blank verse. So would we have had blank verse in the hands of uh, Shakespeare uh, if Henry Howard, the Earl of Surrey, hadn't done it first? Don't know. Annibal Caro, the most important Italian translation, and it's the most often reprinted of all the translations. Moving down to the 18th century, Vasily Petrov into Russian, working in the court of Catherine the Great, who Russia is playing catch up with the other powers in Europe and wanting to get its own national literature there. It's very interesting. Petrov translates the, his first published translation of Virgil's Aeneid is 1770, and then we get the first Russian epic within a decade. Very collapsed time frame. Uh, I strayed into Argentinian Spanish and found that Juan Cruz Varela is doing the same thing very explicitly in his preface uh, for Argentinian Spanish. And uh, in Hebrew, Michael Lebenson, uh, writing in Vilnius in the middle of the 19th century, explicitly in his preface saying, all the other languages have translations of Virgil and Hebrew doesn't. So we need to have it. So he starts work on that. He, he only does one book before he dies tragically young. And then in the language, the made up language of Esperanto, <laughs> which is meant to be a world language, not a nationalistic language, there are actually three translations of the Aeneid. <laughs> Who knew? Well, I discovered that doing this project. Uh, so the earliest one is by a French guy called Henri Vallien, uh, 1906. But this, um, oh, I've got some pictures for you because this was nice to have a couple of pictures. This is Gavin Douglas from the, um, well, I can't remember where, and Henry Howard looking very dashing, I think, <laughs> in that portrait there. The, the, the trajectory of translation being foundational to being able to write original epic is very, very clear in the early French history. This is probably an illegible slide, but I put on here all the earliest French translations of Virgil, just so as you can see the kind of volume of material I've been having to deal with and select from. So there is an anonymous translation from 1483. It's not really a translation. It's a, what we call a remaniement, a re-handling because it leaves out great chunks of the Aeneid and adds in bits when it likes to expand because the readership is going to write it, it's going to like it. The first thing that you can call a translation in French dates from 1500, and it's this guy, Octavien de saint gelais and it's written in manuscript and presented to the French king, Louis Duse, in 1500. It's not printed until 1509, after Octavian's death. And I think I am going to uh, use this for my cover. It's so rich and it's such an important translation. So this is from the manuscript, which is in the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. 
Um, it's just gorgeous, isn't it? Uh, it actually is so meta because it shows Octavian presenting his translation to the king. But this is the frontispiece of the translation. Isn't that perfect? And so you can imagine in this project I've been doing a lot of reading of prefaces. In fact, I've probably read more prefaces than actual translations because I, I have to know where the translators are situating themselves. Uh, Saint-Gelais is very helpful in his pre preface. He expresses a self-conscious desire to produce a translation with much greater accuracy than the earlier medieval trans tradition. And he clearly thinks he's undertaking a patriotic labour which will reflect glory onto King Louis XII, who he is trying to get as his patron. So this is a complicated thing. He's doing it for himself, but also for the nation. And this is such an important translation because it's the first step in a number of steps, just going back to that slide, see all of those many steps in translating Virgil until we get down to 1560, well, 1552, he starts Joachim du Bellay, member of the Pleiad, the important group of poets and thinkers who are trying to transform French literature, modernize it. We get uh, Du Bellay translating a couple of books of the Aeneid, 1552 to 1560 they are published. But um, his buddy in the Pleiad was Pierre de Ronsard, and they were the two leading lights of the Pleiad. And between them, they demonstrated theory and in practice how cultural capital could be attained in replicating what, for, what Dante and Petrarch had done for Toscano, so that's their aim. And French always has this inferiority complex to Italian culture, which is it's why it's very interesting. And there are so many translations of Virgil in French as they're trying to match the status of Italian literature. So Dumoulin, um, who writes theory about translation, and he translates in his books four and six. Ronsard does not translate Virgil, but he starts work on an original epic called the Fonciad, he starts it in the 1540s. He publishes four books of it in 1572. It's the only four books he wrote. He planned it in 24 books. But that's probably a shout out to Homer. It's double the number of books in Virgil's Aeneid. And Ronsard aimed to pen a grand poem in the style of the ancients to connect the history of the French monarchy to the mythic heroism of characters and events described by Homer and Virgil. And he rewrites mythology and history. He makes his hero, Francion, the son of Hector, the Trojan Hector. He makes him survive the sack of Troy. Right, Everett all classes is cringing in Rome now because we know that Hector's son is thrown from the ramparts after the sack of Troy. And this guy, Francion, goes on to found the Frankish nation. And this we see from the opening of the poem, which reworks the opening of Iliad 1, which you have on the back of your handout. So I'm not going to read that out, but I think you can see at a glance that this is a thoroughly Virgilian text. So I put it to you that the Franciad would not have been even begun, it wasn't finished, but it would, couldn't have been written without Virgil, without having studied Virgil in the Latin, and that the French that Ronsard uses was affected by that whole chain of translations that had been happening for the previous decades. So that's how that works. Now I'm going to move to the fourth section of the talk, and I've called this Harnessing Virgil Translation to Political and Religious Causes. English Virgils of the 17th century, are they royalist or republican? And there are many, many translations I could have talked about here. I'm going to make a transition through the case of George Sands, and this takes me back to the remarks I made at the beginning about Virgil being used as a colonialist and imperialist text. George Sands, version of Aeneid 1, which was called an essay, that's interesting, an attempt, right, an essay to the translation of Virgil's Aeneas, was included as the appendix to his translation, it's a famous translation of Ovid's Metamorphoses, published in 1632 which is definitely a royalist book. It contains panegyrics addressed to Charles I and his wife. 
Sands wrote his translation of Aeneid Book One before he went out to serve as treasurer of the Virginia Company. He was in Virginia in 1621 to 1625. He doesn't pursue the project further. He sets it aside, he tells us this in his preparatory material, as too heavy a burden. Why was translating the Aeneid too heavy a burden? Why does he spend his time in Virginia translating Ovid? Why doesn't he finish Virgil? Well, the bigger picture is that the colonialist message of the Aeneid did, as I already said, hold a strong appeal at the time for English imperialists who are happy to identify themselves as Trojans divinely ordained to found a, a mighty empire. And what's really interesting in Sam's translation of Book One is that he makes slight alterations to Virgil's text which hint at the Virginian context. So he translated it before he went out to Virginia, but he obviously <coughs> tweaked it when he came back and before he published it in the Ovid volume. And what I think is really interesting is that he probably translated Dido's generous speech of welcome to Aeneas and the Trojans soon after the marriage in 1614 of the Indian princess Pocahontas to the colonist John Rolfe, an event which must have seemed to promise so much for the colonists. So why didn't he continue? Uh, well, obviously, I've read the scholarship on, John, on uh, George Sands, and I agree with it in this case that his experience of the disastrous Jamestown massacre at the colony, which happened within the first year of his arriving there, and he might actually have been part of the reason that it happened, traumatised him so deeply as to shape his view of the colonial enterprise. After he returned to England in 1625, he never returned to Virginia, nor to the project of translating the Aeneid. So, I have a, a great chunk of my book on 17th century English translations, and how most of them are royalist, and some of them are, one or two of them are republican. So, John Denham is an important, he was an important poet in the 17th century. He was a royalist, he was exiled after the execution of Charles I. He translated in the book two, which was published um, while the exile was happening, before the restoration. You can tell that it's royalist in all sorts of uses of language that he has, but especially because he actually stops translating in the book two before the end of the book. Where does he stop it? With the death of Priam, king of Troy, whose headless corpse is lying on the beach, or on the strand, as he actually says. Strand, very important. It's a way of translating beach in Latin, harena. Um, but Charles I's execution happened just off the strand. So just by even choosing his end point and not going further in book two, he declares his royalist allegiance in writing that translation. And the whole of the, the the court was uh, sitting around in, in Paris and places like that, all talking to each other, and that's where a lot of these royalist translations um, took shape. Somebody you won't have heard of, quite rightly, he's not very interesting, John Boys. Uh, in his 1660, so we're at the Restoration now, in 1660 translation of Book 6, includes lots of panegyrical expressions to welcome Charles II. And he puts as an appendix in this volume this absolutely nauseating speech of welcome to the king, which he plans to deliver on the king's arrival at Dover. Actually, he never got the chance to, to deliver it, but he does print it. On the other hand, we've got this guy, John Vickers, the 12 Aeneids, full translation of the Aeneid, published in 1632, so I'm just going back a couple of decades here. He was a Puritan, a parliamentarian, his writings, his other writings were anti-Catholic and pro-parliamentary. Um, he writes a Republican in the end. His translation is Republican. And how do we know that? It's because when we get, uh, there's a little bit in the book six about Brutus, the slayer of the Roman kings. He brings about the Roman Republic in the 6th century BCE. And how you handle Brutus, you can make him a, a villain if you're a royalist translator, or you can make him a hero if you're a Republican, and that's what John Vickers does. Samuel Butler dismissed Vickers as an irreverent and incompetent translator, 
He says he was unqualified to translate the poet of royalty because he was a dissident and a parliamentarian. So obviously, he was very biased when he says this. The greatest English translation before Sarah Rubens is that of John Dryden. And maybe it is still the greatest. It's difficult to compare a 17th century translation with a 21st century one. It's been said that John Dryden's Virgil, 1697, was a Jacobite work. It favoured the exiled king, James II. Uh, and I've given you his life story there about how uh, Dryden was in... Well, he switches, he switches, he switches. He's only 18 when Charles I is executed. He works for Cromwell, Secretary of State. He writes heroic standards on the death of Oliver Cromwell. Then he celebrates the Restoration, becomes Poet Laureate. And then with the death of Charles II and the accession of Catholic James II, he converts to Catholicism to be with James II, but this only lasts for three years before the Glorious Revolution chucks James II out, and we go back to Protestant with the installation of James II's daughter and William of Orange. And that's Dryden's fall from favour. That's when he starts translating madly to make a living. He actually makes a living from translation. Is his Virgil a Jacobite work? Well, it does have a lot of emphasis on legitimate succession, which might lead you to think that. It has sympathy for the native people who resist the leader foisted on them from the outside. That's kind of anti-William of Orange. He makes Aeneas the perfect prince who could provide sure succession in his line. That's a phrase that Dryden actually inserts into the opening seven lines of the Aeneid. There's nothing in the Latin that warrants that. So there are political elements there in Dryden. Um, I don't think it's a highly politicized translation, though. It's published by subscription, and there are people of all different politics and religions in the sub subscription list. So it's something bigger than that. And Dryden insists himself that he was translating Virgil for my native country. Okay, again in the publicity for this talk, I promised to share some intriguing and moving moments on my long journey. So here's an intriguing one. It takes us back to the 11th century. Now, this is the earliest version of the Aeneid. I am going to call it a version. It is not a translation because it's not true. It omits a lot and it adds a lot. But it's the Middle Irish Inhiata Inyasa, which naturalizes the Latin text into the recognizable form and shape of an Irish saga. This we call a domesticating process. It's something I met again and again and again in later translations where the translator makes the translation familiar and easy for their readership, but always with differing particulars, of course, of the actual domestication. The process of domestication of the Aeneid in the Middle Irish Aeneid includes turning the tawny jasper on Aeneas' sword into red Irish carbuncles, uh, having the Latins engage in the characteristic Irish sport of hurling, which I'm sure they didn't do in Roman antiquity. <laughs> More significant still are the omissions, abbreviations, and additions, which reflect the Irish audience's expectations. Omissions include, um, if omissions can include, he doesn't, the author doesn't tell the story of Hercules and Capus' cattle, which is a cattle raiding story which comes in book eight of the Aeneid. This is very surprising to me because um, I, lots of Irish literature deals with cattle raids, and I think this translator just didn't go there and it could have gone there. <coughs> um, abbreviations include episodes which attracted special attention in the later translation history of the Aeneid, such as the death of Priam, which I've just talked about, the death of Dido, and parts of Aeneas' visit to the underworld. Additions, uh, include in the stylistics, so alliterative phrases are very characteristic of older Irish narratives. I am not going to tr attempt tr pronouncing any of that, but you can see this is not in Virgil, right, all these um, adjectives. The Irish sagas have a deep interest in genealogy, and so Aeneas is often called Aeneas the son of Anchises, where he isn't called that in the Latin. And King Latinus, the king of the Latins, Ancestry, this is just beautiful, is traced all the way back to Noah. <laughs> so in effect, the author or authors of this text 
They transmute Aeneas into a traditional Irish hero with the qualities of an Irish hero like a Finn or O'Sheen. They render him more chivalrous and perfect than the Latin poem does. So, for example, Aeneas has a speech of despair in book one when he's at his lowest ebb. They just cut that. <laughs> Unflattering remarks about him being uh, very effeminate in book four are converted into praise, and so on and so forth. So the Impiacta Ignasa is a classic case of translation situated towards the domesticating end of the domesticating foreignizing spectrum proposed by the German philosopher Friedrich Schliemacher in his 1823 lecture to the Berlin Royal Academy of Sciences entitled On the Different Methods of Translating. Now I've had to read a lot of translation theory to do this project, but this quotation I've known for a long time, it is very useful to posit a spectrum where you can map any translation on this spectrum between very easy for the reader or very difficult for the reader. Now I'm going to share with you two cases of translation that I found very moving. My first comes from the Polish language, and it's an example of the phenomenon whereby particular cultures respond to Virgil as if he were addressing them specifically, personally. In Poland, Virgil was seen as a source of comfort in sorrow and a prophet of hope for the Polish people. Virgil's fourth eclogue, which prophesies the birth of a special baby boy who will bring back the golden age, and later on identified with Christ, and so that poem is known as the Messianic eclogue, but Virgil is writing before Christ, so it, it can't be that he's predicting Christ. This poem is central to the phenomenon known as Polish Messianism. Now, in Poland, there had long been a deep familiarity with Virgil's work, so I'm just going to focus here on the specific context given by the demise of the Polish-Lithuanian Commonwealth at the Third Partition of Poland in 1795, when both the population and the territory were divided between the Russian Empire, the Kingdom of Prussia, and the Austrian Habsburg Empire. I'm embarrassed to say that before I did this project, I didn't know that Poland didn't exist for 125 years, and, and maybe some of you didn't know that either. This loss of independence, which would not be restored until the end of World War I, after a long interval, and which saw the suppression of the Polish language and culture, generated an especially strong identification with the fate of Troy and the Trojans. Leading members of Polish society, including the king, noblemen, politicians, poets, and artists, were forced into a diaspora, the great emigration throughout Europe. For these Poles, expelled from their homeland and living as exiles, Virgil seemed to understand their plight, especially in his narrative of the sack of Troy in Aeneid Book Two. At the same time, Virgil's works were also seen as offering hope for the future, in the prom promise of the restoration of a golden age in Eclogue 4. The poet Jan Pavel Voronich repurposed material from Aeneid 1 in his four-book poem, Sviatinia Sibilia, the Temple of Sibyl, to indicate that just as Troy had to fall for Rome to rise, so Poland had to fall for the new Poland to rise. And Eclogue 4, the so-called Messianic Eclogue, struck a particular chord. It's a key text in the development of Polish Messianism, an idea which took stronghold during the 19th century, as seen in the trio of Polish Romantic poets known as the Three Bards, Mickiewicz, Słowacki, and Kraszynski. I'm sorry if that's wrong. <laughs> <laughs> The last of these uh, took as his epigraph to his best-known poem, The Moment Before Dawn, lines from Eclogue 4. And that poem is regarded as the strongest expression of Messianism. In this, Kraszynski depicts Poland's partition as a sacrifice for the sins of the entire world and predicts Poland's resurrection as a nation and her emergence as a leader of humankind. So, when, I'm, when I was working on this, I was always looking for patterns, which texts, which bits of Virgil are being translated at particular times. And I found that there was a particular concentration of translations into Polish of Eclogue 4 at this period in the 19th century. And so we find these eminent poets, uh, Falensky and Pawlikowski, translating Eclogue 4 
at this time. This is why, because of this Polish messianism. My second moving case of a translation of Virgil is L.A.S. German's blank verse translation of the Georgics, written while he was interned in World War II, and it was published after his return to England in 1947. The translation started life as a distraction during the interruption of British life in the Malaysian outpost of empire caused by the fall of Singapore to the Japanese, an event described by Winston Churchill as the worst disaster in British military history and which saw 80,000 British, Australian and Indian troops taken prisoner. Jamin was not a troop, he was a civilian, not, not a soldier, he was a civilian, um, which I'll explain in a minute. I've given you the title page at the very, in the purple bit at the top of the slide, The Singing Farmer, a translation of Virgil's Georgics made by German during internment in Changi Jail and Simei Road Camp, Singapore, February 1942 to September 1945. And then the, the beautiful publication has, has four fantastic woodcuts by a female artist, and I've just given you one of those. The book also has a poignant dedication to the memory of my only son, Peter, and all his friends who died with him in the Second World War, somewhere in the Pacific. German was one of 3,000 civilians interned after the fall of Singapore in Changi Prison. Food was in short supply, but the internees engaged in intensive farming methods to produce green vegetables to try to stave off berry berry. German had been a Latin teacher and headmaster at the prestigious boys' school, Malay College, in Kuala Kangsa. His preface makes extraordinary reading. Without elaborating on the squalor, progressive starvation, and other ills of life in internment, he nonetheless evokes them vividly by finding intersections with the material of the Georgics. This is Virgil's poem about farming. For example, the same kind of weevil as attacked the old Italian farmer's pile of spelt appeared in our rice ration. And then he talks about the lab or improbus, the, the wicked toil, it's a famous phrase in book one of the Georgics, of our vegetable gardeners literally scratching up the earth with mattocks, a quote from Virgil, dunging it whenever sludge could be obtained from the sewage farm. And then he talks about one enthusiastic gardener um, who grows corn cobs by careful seed selection following Virgil, uh, Georgics book one. So I thought that, that was a very moving thing to find that, so I have a discussion of that in the book. Finally, I'm going to share with you some material that I was so excited by that I'm going to do another book on this because it didn't really fit in the book on translations because it's the phenomenon of travesties. Now, a travesty is a reworking. It's not a translation. There are lots and lots of travesties of Virgil. They follow the plot line really closely, but instead of making Aeneas and the Trojans and the Latins, dignified, heroic warriors. They bring them down to the base level. They make them drunkards and slobs who are only interested in eating and feasting and sex. So travesty, I couldn't resist discussing a couple of these in my book. But I assume when I scratch the surface, there are so many of them, there's going to be another book and I think this will be my last book. It's going to be co-authored with my collaborator in the edited volume, Zara Matiosova Petrolo, who teaches at Miami University in Ohio. And we've already planned how we're going to divvy it up. I'm going to do the Italian, French, English, and Dutch material, and she's going to do the German, Russian, Russian is her first language, um, Ukrainian, Polish, and Belarusian material. I think I get some Occitan and some Sicilian stuff in there as well. Not that I know these languages, but I will learn, I will learn something about them. Travesties of the birth of the Aeneid start actually very innocuously in Italy in the 1630s. The first travesty, it, it doesn't seem to be satirical. It's not trying to pull Virgil down. It's just being playful. From there, guess where we go next? To France, of course. <laughs> And this is because the guy, Scavon, 
who does Virgil Travesti, he actually goes to Italy just after the Italian travesty is published, and it's all the rage there, and he comes back to Paris and says, I've got to do that. And he and his followers get to work and do the whole of the Aeneid. Then, guess where it goes? It goes to England. Because of all these connections, especially you've got the all these guys that were in exile, the court of Charles, the Caroline court, the, Cal, the Caroline court in exile, coming back to England in 1660. And Charles Cotton and a whole bunch of other people write travesties, which are savage, scurrilous, scatological. They're really obscene. <laughs> there are no words. <laughs> but it's very interesting that in the title of his travesty, Charles Cotton actually gives you the genealogy. He calls it Scaronides, son of Scaron, right? He says, I'm just doing what Scaron did in French, but I'm going to do it in English. The phenomenon re-emerges in Vienna in the 18th century with Alois Blumauer's German travesty, Vigilzainé's Travestiette, which in turn is translated into Hungarian and Swedish, as it got translations of travesties. Okay. and which generates independent travesties in Russian, Ukrainian, Polish, and Belarusian. And I've given you, I don't know how well you can see this slide. This is, this is going to be in my book. It's going to be in both books. It's going to be in the book that Cambridge is publishing, and wherever Zara and I publish our book, this one has to be in. This is a fantastic scene. This is Dido hosting Aeneas at the banquet at the end of Aeneas book one. Food is a marvellous time for, marvellous material for travesties because you substitute your own food. In fact, Virgil doesn't actually really mention any food. He just says the food was wonderful and the, the wine was heavenly. What you see here is a Viennese, a late 18th century Viennese take on Dido's banquet. What can you see there? Flagons of wine <laughs> at the front. You can see um, an ox in a dish, a whole ox, and that's mentioned in the German text. Um, and by the way, do you notice how Dido and Aeneas look like 18th century Viennese, Aeneas with his pigtails? <laughs> the absolutely fantastic thing in this picture, I couldn't believe it, when I, I was looking at this book online, and I, you know, my German isn't that strong, I looked at this picture and I thought, that's a cake. That's a cake. It's a Viennese tort. Okay? And what is on the cake? A hero. That's Aeneas on the, the cake. And then I read the text on the facing page. And it says, Dido served up a cake. It's got scenes of Troy round the edge of the cake. And the hero, Aeneas, is made of butter. <laughs> That's what you can do with travesty. <laughs> so I'm going to finish up by, oh, I should say that for a minute. I'm going to finish up with what happens in Ukraine with Ivan Kotlyarevsky's Eneida, 1798. And this, we, here we find the Aeneid being treated as cultural capital in the establishment of a national literary language. Remember what I said about French and Ronsard? What's really, really weird here is that all the other languages I've talked about, they have translation first and then they have travesty. Okay. The time gap gets shorter. In Russia, the first translation of the Indian 1770, the first travesty is in the 1780s. Ukraine doesn't, Ukrainian doesn't bother with translation. They go straight <laughs> to travesty. And Kotlyarevsky's Eneida published from 1798 onwards. It is a travesty. It, it's not scurrilous, but the Trojans become Cossacks. <laughs> they eat Cossack food, they swear Cossack oaths, they wear Cossack armour, they go to Cossack places in, in Ukraine. All the place names on that map all turn into Ukrainian place names. And I mentioned in my note to Mark about what this talk would include. Rabbit holes I went down. My worst rabbit hole, categorically, was spending two weeks reading about Cossacks. <laughs> <laughs> Until I slapped myself on the wrist and said, 
my goodness me, this is only going to give me a paragraph. I can't spend two weeks reading for every paragraph in my book. Kali Rusky's Eneida is described by the curator of Ukraine's Literature Museum as the first literary work published in vernacular Ukrainian. And according to a 1942 edition of Ukrainian Weekly, the Eneida started not only the Ukrainian literary renaissance, but also the Ukrainian national renaissance with its goal of a free and independent and democratic Ukraine. In the 20th century, Kotlyarevsky's travesty, or the Inir, inspired operas in 1906 and 1910, was turned into a rock opera in 1985, and a full-length animated movie released in 1991, a very highly significant date that saw the Ukrainian parliament declare independence. But perhaps the most eloquent testimony, and I'm going to finish here, of the lasting importance of Kotlyarevsky's Eneida is the gold coin that commemorates the 200th anniversary of the poem, minted in 1998. <coughs> the coin shows the poet, Kotlyarevsky, playing the Ukrainian national instrument, the bandura, and this coin is presented in a neoclassical style that resembles a medal. And um, a numismatist at the University of Calgary, I gave a talk about travesties there, she kindly made this, um, this, this caption for the coin for me. So who knew? This is travesty, the foundational work of Ukrainian modern literature. It's a travesty of Virgil's Iliad, in which the Trojans become Cossacks. And it's celebrated perfectly seriously in, with a coin. And Ukrainian students I've met say, yes, yes, we had to learn bits of that and recite it at school. They still do. Who knew? We don't celebrate Dryden's magnificent translation of Virgil on our coinage, but the Ukrainians, that's what they do here. So that's it from me until you have some questions. Here is that slide again giving you the outline of my book because I think that might prompt you to ask some particular questions. Thank you for listening. I just love talking about this. I could talk for hours more. <laughs>